So I will welcome people to take their seats and we're going to get started momentarily uh, as uh, people continue to come in. If you want to, sure. <laughs> Gotta do whatever the cuckoo says. Uh, my name is Marsh Anderson. I am Korean Anishinaabe. I grew up in the North End. My family is from Treaty 1 territory, and we are very happy to welcome yourselves and Dr. Wyatt uh, here to our homelands today. Uh, and in starting, I'm going to uh, invite Margaret Lavely, who is Anishinaabe, and from Seging First Nation and is our elder in residence with Ongamazin to start us off in a good way. Bonjour. Anin Tansi. Ujash Kubi Kondishnikas Makwandu Dem. Migweche Kidwan Chibena Mian Menon Ongum. Mi weche na go go gana kiyo atuma. Mi weche kidwan madisi wenunje. Mi weche kidwan abinunje akunje. Nim shum sinanek ni go kumenanek atsukanak. E bugusen de mang chumeno seyang uma. Kauna kiyan hugo kena gauna kiyo atuma. We be arguing do I need it? We be the shindan. I need a comic book. Uma kae dashko a ingajin comic book. The states. Me any noint is sayang with him. Gijemane do what so can. Me the shin weekend amen an ingaje. Me no sayang. The name that I was honored with from the grandmothers is Water Lily, and I'm of the Bear Clan, originally from Saiging First Nation. I give thanks today for life. I give thanks to all of you. And I especially want to give thanks to Dr. Wyatt, who's come from the States to join us and to give us some, some teachings and some lessons that we need in this um, place of, of work and this place of learning, this place of uh, higher learning. Um, we're looking for ways that we can work more effectively with our indigenous people here in Manitoba in the institution as well as in hospitals in the healthcare system. And I listened this morning to the good doctor talk about some of the issues that they face as well in the United States. And there's much learning to be done. And it, I don't think it, it's a one-time 
thing that this is what we're going to learn today and we'll carry it through our work time here. I think it has to be practiced all the time. And how do we do that? And we look to you for some answers. And I'm sure he will give us the answers we need to hear. So I ask for open-mindedness. I ask for a hope open heart so that we will begin to have that understanding and that healing that we need within places like this. So with that, I say me which, I, I say me which for life. Thank you. Me which, Margaret. So this morning during the workshop, one of the uh, participants mentioned the university's territorial acknowledgement, and particularly the fact that the territorial acknowledgement um, references the past harms of colonization, but not the ongoing harms of colonization or ongoing colonial practices. Um, and one of those ongoing harms of colonization is actually unequal care unequal health care by race in this province and in this country. And uh, when I think about what my ancestors were signing up for at the time when they were represented by uh, Chief Henry Prince at the Stone Fort Treaty, is that isn't it, right? Like what we signed up for was the equal opportunity to the highest attainable standard of health, to a country free of racism, um, and to share equally in a relationship of mutual respect and peace. And so each of us sitting in this audience, regardless of um, when your family came here or if your family was always here, need to, to share in that ongoing commitment and responsibility for living up to the dreams of our ancestors um, in our homelands. Now, I have been doing uh, work in Indigenous health and anti-racism for 15 plus years at, at this point in time. And the work gets tough sometimes, right? And particularly, I would say over the last year or two, with the rise of the alt-right and white supremacy groups and hate crimes being on the rise, the it's okay to be white papering that happened um, at our university, it can be pretty discouraging. And uh, I've been reading this book lately by Dr. Ibram Kendi, Stamped from the Beginning, and he talks about the rise of racism and racist ideas in the Americas. And one of the things that he said is, I saw two distinct historical forces. I saw a dual and dueling history of racial progress and the simultaneous progression of racism. I saw the anti-racist force of inequality marching forward and the racist force of inequality marching forward, progressing in rhetoric, in tactics, and in policies. So what keeps me hopeful is that at the same time as we are seeing the backlash that we talked about in the United States post-Obama or our own rise um, of white supremacy movements in Canada is also the strengthening of anti-racism movements locally, uh, provincially, and nationally happening both within medical education and healthcare and outside of it. And you know, one thing that's interesting outside of healthcare is that in our upcoming provincial election, there'll be the opportunity to elect the first black sitting MLA ever in our province. We've never had a black person in our provincial legislature before. When we talk about anti-racism inside of healthcare and medical education, I think about the support of Dr. Postal, who's here with us today, um, and giving us the space and the resources to really develop a strong Indigenous-led team with the largest Indigenous health institute in the country, and the effective partnerships that we've been able to build since we recognize that the primary nature of our business is actually relationships. And I'll uh, particularly mention the Winnipeg Regional Health Authority, who is one of the sponsors for today's events. Uh, and when Riel and uh, Krista Williams were at dinner last night and previously, um, both have stated their ongoing commitment to develop an anti-racism strategy uh, and work with us since they're our primary teaching site uh, to shift things in our, our learning and healthcare environments. 
I also want to uh, acknowledge the Center for Healthcare Innovation and Frank Krupka is here from there. Uh, we've been working with the Center for Healthcare Innovation on developing a new indigenous healthcare quality platform. Um, as one aspect of that, we are uh, pleased to welcome our Indigenous Community Advisory Council who are here with us today in the front row. <laughs> And I'm really excited uh, at the work that we'll start doing together tomorrow, building on what's done today, um, to get beyond the low bar of any healthcare is good enough to Indigenous peoples to the highest bar of the highest quality, culturally safe, anti-racist healthcare practice that us, our communities, and our relatives are all entitled to. We're co-hosting this event with CHI because we cannot improve Indigenous healthcare quality without addressing whiteness and dismantling institutional racism. And this is why we are so thrilled to welcome Dr. Ron Wyatt, who's the Chief Quality Officer with uh, Cook County Health, one of the largest public health systems in the United States. Dr. Wyatt is originally from Alabama, and uh, at dinner last night, we discussed uh, how much we actually have in common so sometimes there's this perception that Canada is less racist or more politely racist. But when you think about things like Tuskegee and the nutritional experiments that happened in residential schools and, and North America, or some of the tragic deaths uh, that we discussed last night in Alabama and what happened with Brian St. Clair, uh, the way that racism operates and impacts black and indigenous folks uh, is more similar than it is different between our two places. Dr. Wyatt is an internist. He's an internationally respected quality improvement and patient safety leader, having worked at the Joint Commission, which is the largest health service accrediting body in the United States, uh, and as far away as Qatar. So please join me now in welcoming Dr. Ron Wyatt. Uh, so thank you, uh, Margaret, for those uh, kind words. And, and Dr. Anderson, thank you and your fabulous team for all of the arrangements and logistics and just a, a really terrific morning today at the workshop. And, and then thank you again to the workshop participants who are here uh, and all of you uh, for taking the time out uh, to be here today to uh, hear a few words from me uh, and share um, my passion and my heart about this topic. So I appreciate that. I have a goal, which is to get a one hour presentation down to three PowerPoints. Uh, I assure you that won't happen today. So it remains a goal. So we will start. And again, I, I would ask also that uh, we receive this with open spirits and open hearts as we go through this topic. Uh, and the topic is going to be um, the, the title of the, the presentation, but also is addressing whiteness and how we clear that path, uh, which should be familiar to some of you in the room. Uh, and in order to clear that path, then there are some things we need to remind ourselves of, and, and for some of us, go back down that path uh, to remember uh, the history, and in many cases, the historical insult uh, of whiteness and racism that uh, exist uh, both here and in the US. So you see here the mission, vi vision, and values, one of which is respect and equity and inclusion. And for us, accountability. This is a topic that we're all accountable for. Another key word here is sustainability. This, this is not a we do this today or we check the box and then we move on. Uh, it's important as we think about this difficult topic that we begin to think about how we sustain the change that I know will happen as we go forward. I have nothing to the close. I'll start here. This was a statement made by Martin Luther King when he was in Chicago, 1963. Of all the forms of inequality, injustice in health is the most shocking and the most inhuman. So that was softened up because saying inhumane for some people felt better. But in fact, when we talk about these topics and what is happening here and in the U.S. and in Cook County where I'm from, it is injustice and it is inhuman injustice. So we're going to spend some time talking about what we call race, uh, what we are describing as whiteness uh, and anti-racism 
and, and hopefully we'll leave you with some ideas about what we can all to, can do collectively as we move forward. So what we can say about race is that it's the social idea. It is something that culture has created. It changed over time and continues to change. It shapes how we think. It shapes our social perceptions and patterns of what we see as opportunity. But there's some things we need to know about this thing called race. One, this is a modern creation. Uh, there has not always been such a thing as race. There's no genetic basis for race. There is no such thing as a human subspecies. There are variations between races. For instance, my DNA can be just as similar to a person who is a native Korean as it is between two native Koreans. So we're not talking about some, some DNA genetic difference. We do know, though, that this thing called race is used and has been used to justify inequality. And it's been accepted as natural when it's not. It's biological and it is real. And we'll talk more about color blindness. And I will say at the outset that for, for a person who says I'm colorblind, I will say you are lying. It is a lie. There's no such thing as being colorblind. And we'll talk about that more. So racism. Racism. So Kamara Jones says it is a system, and I agree. It structures opportunity. It assigns value based on nothing more than how a person looks. Then we call it race. But when we begin to look where we stand, on the ground we stand, in order to begin the discussion, first we've got to say, yes, it operates here. We know that it operates here. I know that it operates in Cook County. I know that it operates around the world. The first step on this path as we clear it is to pull up those bitter roots of racism and get rid of them and level the path. Make way for those that will follow us on this path. And we have to work to make sure that the path is not a dead end. But it's clear. So when I first saw this picture, I had a chill. Back in the late 80s, I was in charge of the emergency department at a VA hospital in St. Louis, Missouri. A patient would repeatedly come in his name is Richard. Richard was Navajo. And over time, the residents in training had normalized Richard. Oh, there's Richard again. There's drunk Richard again. Let's just have Richard go and wait in the waiting area. Because we know that whatever his complaint is, it's the alcohol talking, it's not him. Richard doesn't have an emergency. So he can sit outside and wait until we're ready to see him. And I said to the trainees, our obligation to Richard and every human being that walks through the door <coughs> is to do a comprehensive assessment and give the fullness of our training to him. Because Richard's going to fool you one day. So Richard came in. The typical happened. It's just Richard. He can wait into the, in the waiting area. We have other patients who are more important and emergent. Someone rushed in and said Richard was on the floor, unresponsive. He had been out there for five, six hours. He was in fulminant pulmonary edema had had a massive anterior myocardial infarction. What do you think Richard's chief complaint was when he walked up to the counter in the emergency department? I have chest pain. I have chest pain. But our, our racism allowed us to not see him 
as a human being who had chest pain. It interfered with our very intellect. It nullified the thing that we swore to, that we won't hurt anyone. The truth is we hurt too many people. And the data, I will guarantee you here, like in Cook County says, we hurt more people of color than people that are white. And we have to ask ourselves why. Because we've institutionalized it. And we've normalized it. That's a photograph from the nutrition studies that happened here. Food is medicine. There are places in the U.S. where for non-white students, attendance at school is highest on Mondays and Tuesdays. Why? Because they've been hungry all weekend. Food for some people has been used as a weapon, as has residential segregation. Most places, probably here. You can draw a line or a cross over a city and you can tell people where the white people and the non-white people live. Why? We know that these practices are linked to poor outcomes. Heart disease, diabetes, amputations. Who's placed on dialysis versus who gets a kidney transplant? Which population of diabetics receive amputations versus revascularization? Look at the data. In Chicago and St. Louis, they remain two of the most segregated cities in the United States, if not the world. Because there are places that black people weren't allowed to, weren't allowed to live or even get a mortgage. When I lived in St. Louis, me and my family were redlined. There were only place, certain places where we could get a mortgage. And typically, it was the highest interest rate, based solely on race. The prison industrial complex. If, if I look at the countries with the most non-white people incarcerated, Oklahoma would be number one in the world. Then ask yourself, what is different about Oklahoma? Well, one of the things different about Oklahoma is one of the most incarcerated groups are American Indian juveniles. Juveniles. Now they're locked into that system. If we look at the rates of incarceration as countries in the world, my state, Alabama, is number five in the world. Most of those incarcerated are African-American men. Well, what about here? This is what the numbers say. Chronic incarceration is a health and health care issue. And we have to deal with the root causes once again. Even as I drove in last night from the airport, the taxi driver said to me, the police don't bother me, but they do bother the Red Indians. It is a system. Racism is a system. It structures who benefits and who doesn't. It becomes institutionalized. then we are allowed to experiment on non-white populations. Dr. Anderson mentioned Tuskegee and the syphilis trials that happened there. We know that Johns Hopkins in the US is referred to in the black community as the plantation. We recognize that the life expectancy for black men uh, in Alabama has decreased since the Tuskegee experiments because they lost trust.
That leads to shorter life expectancy, poor outcomes, and then we, we, we comfort ourselves by saying, well, that's a difficult population that is non-adherent or non-compliant. No, that's not it. The population no longer trusts us. We lost that trust. And really underneath that, not only have we lost the trust, but before that, we didn't share who we are at our heart's level. We decided somewhere along the way that the population is here to serve us when we should be the servants. Whether you're black or white or brown, no matter. So what is whiteness? Is it ethnicity or is it an illusion? And why is it so hard to talk about this? Why is it a challenge to deal with this reality? What kind of emotions are you feeling right now? Some of us would rather avoid it. And we've developed strategies to avoid talking about race and whiteness. The population that we serve should compel us to increase our racial literacy, but we don't want to participate. Again, we feel uncomfortable. It challenges our worldview. Then we try to diminish it, dilute it, demystify it, say it's not real, or someone else's problem 100 years ago. Or, we'll talk a bit about later, we, we manage through these microaggressions. And then we could just shut it all down. And just say either you're just out of control or has been shared with me, you're just an angry black man. It's not a problem. So there are norms when we begin to think about race talk. We'll talk a bit, and we talked a bit this morning about the colorblind protocol, or it's just not polite conversation. And particularly in academia, as an academic protocol. And a lot of times, this conversation is shut down by the teachers and professors. But the classroom becomes a microcosm of the rest of the environment and the world. And the same strategies are used in a learning environment. So why is that? Why shut this talk down? Is it because Maybe someone fears that they will appear to be a racist. Or maybe you realize that you are racist. Or I don't want to confront my white privilege. The white privilege that I did very little maybe to earn. Or as one friend said to me, I'm a victim of unearned white privilege. Then he added this, but I'm not giving it back. <laughs> and then we fear that we have to somehow take some personal responsibility for racism, which means I got to confront my racist friend. So we deny racialized experience of other people of color. We enjoy the privilege. And we talk about meritocracy. And, and, and I've heard this when, when a person says to me, a white person says, well, Ron, you know, you made it. <laughs> <laughs> so why should we talk about this? It's, you've, you're a clear example of how black men can make it. Now, I shut down discussions of meritocracy. It's racism. We want to sustain this hierarchy and appear to be innocent in it. I had no idea there, there was racism here. Can't be. I've never seen it.
and we become paralyzed. We become paralyzed because, again, the privilege feels good. It scares us. And if we say we're colorblind, I don't see color. That's just a way to get out of taking responsibility and accountability for our actions. So then you're contributing to the injustice and the unfairness, and you're contributing to the racism. Or dare I say, that makes you a racist. So what's whiteness? Whiteness dominates our culture in the West. Again, it gives privilege. It shapes societies. Toni Morrison says it's seen as something neutral, the result of a blending of colors which will transcend. And we had that discussion this morning about transcendence. Or as, as we think of that, we're now in a post-racial society because in the U.S., we elected Barack Obama as president, which frankly has led to a rise of, of right-wing racists and white terrorists in the United States. I don't know about here. So white people tend to create these dominant images that are pervasive in the world. It's constructed in the image of whiteness. And it shapes society. So whiteness and colorblindness, two sides of the same coin, there's a luxury in whiteness. Do we understand the lives of people of color? Do we acknowledge it? Or do we embrace whiteness so we continue to benefit from racism? So we have to start to think about how do we become anti-racist. The first step is to admit that we need to condemn it. That is not socially acceptable. That requires work, doesn't it? That's hard work. It's not. It's hard work. And if it's hard work, it becomes easy. Because we can openly share it. And we can admit, that's how I used to be, but I'm not that person today, and you're not going to be that person tomorrow. Because I will be unrelenting and making you an anti-racist. That's scary, isn't it? I could lose friends. I don't know if I want to go under that kind of personal transformation to have a non-racist identity. That means that will take me from the platinum card to the gold card. I don't know if I'm ready for that. But we have to break that silence. I won't read through these, just some strategies that we have to begin to think about to become an anti-racist organization. What I'm asking here is that this organization truly embraces becoming an anti-racist organization. Have the conversations, plan for it. Make it a part of everything that's done here. Put in place a process. Do not remain silent. Become anti-racist. Talk to coworkers. Bring people in like me that say things that maybe other people won't say. But begin to talk about them. When someone tells that racist joke, call them out. Not here. We don't do that here. That is not who we are. Advocate, not just in the medical school, but throughout the community, but certainly in medical training. We need to address the, cur the curriculum. Are we talking about how to be anti-racist in our curriculum in our community? As the non-white population here begins to grow. So we can either, as the metaphor goes, we can stand still on this conveyor belt, or we can decide 
We're going to stop it. It can be stopped. Racism can be unlearned. We can't acknowledge some of the things that we know, do, and say. And that's just humility. Learn about microaggressions and microassaults and microinsults. So when people say to me, Ron, you speak really good English. <laughs> Ron, you're eloquent. Where, where are you from? <laughs> if you're Asian. You're not like those other people. I'm not an exception. Don't make me an exception. I'm a human being. But it plays out, doesn't it? It plays out about me before I even walked up on the stage. These unconscious thoughts that we have that play out in actions and in healthcare decisions that we make. It works in everyday life. It worked in Chicago in, in what's called the Chicago Resume Study. When Emily and Greg got interviews for jobs and Lakeisha and Jamal didn't. When there was a blinded symphony audition, more women were hired. This is real world stuff. Real world that, that lives inside of what's called a white dominant culture that's typically driven by middle class white men who often see a different standard, a different point of view. And it's mostly selfish. And we start to ignore whiteness by the words that are spoken or the words that are written. So here you see a summation of 170 stories. In it, the word hero was used 32 times. And I'm sorry. That is my daughter <laughs> in Alabama. <laughs> so I, I thought she was watching, so I would just say, Alexis, don't call me again. <laughs> my apologies. Uh, so you look through this and see how um, non-white or Muslim are represented in the media as opposed to, and Hispanics as opposed to whites. So for whites, usually it was described as some mental illness, whereas for blacks it was, uh, and Muslims, terrorists or thugs or some other disparaging term. Does that happen here? Do you assume that media reports are discussing white people unless they say otherwise? So whiteness and superiority travel on that same path. And they're expressed in obvious ways. Typically white associated with Christianity, but only where it upholds a model of what's good and right. Who's heard of Dylan Roof? Dylan Roof shot up a black church in South Carolina in the US. That's Dylan Roof. When he was arrested, the chief of police said he was very quiet, very calm. He didn't talk. He sat down very quickly. He was not problematic. He just killed six people, black people. But he's not problematic. This young man was being chased by police, and they said he tripped and fell during a foot pursuit. 
in the town where I live. This is the picture that ran in the paper. Same TV station, same day. Same TV station, same day. This woman left her kids outside to play. I think the story is inaccurate. She actually left the children in, in the park while she had a job interview. This is the picture that ran in the newspaper. The white man raped an unconscious woman in the alley behind a dumpster and left her there. They ran his Stanford yearbook picture. Right now, in the US, our greatest threat are white supremacists. These are the Proud Boys. This ran, I think, last week. You see a guy holding an ax, he calls my pet. They're seeking wisdom. Kindness he equates with brass knuckles. Are there white supremacists here in Canada? Are they active? Are they recruiting? Yes. So there's this civilizing process that dates back to the 1800s, where people decide to be more civilized, you have to be whiter. In Qatar, there are shelves of whitening products. A friend who was told not to drink black coffee because it, it would make her darker. So to be whiter, you're more civilized. But when we ask white people about whiteness, they find it perplexing, or uncomfortable, or say it's not relevant. I want to talk about ethnicity. And again, the whole idea around being colorblind. If you say you're colorblind, then my race is not important to you. We can't say we're colorblind and say we're going to be anti-racist. We have to make this visible. What does it signify to you? Can you claim white identity without being a racist? This is not Alabama. This is not Cook County. This is here. So in, in, in patient safety and quality, what we say is there are no anomalies, there are signals. So to ignore something by labeling it an, anom an anomaly subsequently will lead to what we call a sentinel event. So we think that this won't lead to something until it does. It's a signal that we need to better understand. It's a signal that impacts non-white people. Or what, what we can call otherism. When not all white people are classified as being white. And this goes back historically also. So when Italians and Greeks and Hungarians came to the US, they were not considered white. They had to earn it. They had to prove value. And then they could be called white. Other whiteness. So mixed race Asians who have a history of discrimination, a history of exclusion, and in many places are vilified for being mixed race or, or biracial or other. Can we become a multicultural university where we're committed 
to being anti-racist at all levels, that we're open, supportive, and responsive, that we have purpose around undoing racism. And when we talk about it, we're authentic. So we, we now talk about diversity and inclusion. So what does inclusion mean? We can be diverse and not inclusive. Who gets promoted? Who gets better job appraisals? Who gets called in more often for counseling sessions? Is there a path for a person in the organization if they come in at the very lowest level that over time they can progress if they are non-white? Are opportunities for professional development offered equally? Are we authentic? Is everyone participating? Can we include these topics in the curriculum? Do we reach out to those that are socially devalued? What is the campus climate around these topics? How do we do support services, residential housing? What are our policies, programs, and practices? And policy-wise, who makes the policies? Who are the policy makers? What do they look like? What are their beliefs? Or are there institutional and structural practices around racism that are being supported and perpetuated? So again, won't read through these. These are just characteristics of a culture competent institution of higher education, but I will pause on cultural competency. And as I said this morning, many organizations, at least in the US, I would say here, we go through cultural competency training. It's a learning module, most often web-based online. And we finish it. And we're expert in non-white people. Now, you're an expert to tell me about me. And since I passed the test, I don't even have to ask you, because I already know. And as I said earlier, getting through your cultural competency training mostly makes for a more culturally competent racist. Where do we need to go? To be humble about cultures, to learn from cultures. And that learning is not a module, it never ceases. It comes with every meeting, every encounter, every clinical visit. Self-reflect, what did I learn from that that can improve it the next time around when I see that patient or that family? So can we reduce racism or can we eliminate racism? Here are some suggestions. Be with people that don't look like you. Be in a collective where you can start to talk about these topics. Co-produce anti-racist approaches. As was mentioned this morning, seek harmony within groups that are white and non-white. Because as I said, we're more alike than not. It shattered my heart when the taxi driver dropped me off at the hotel yesterday and said, this is a really nice area. Just don't come out at night because it's not safe. Why isn't it safe? Because the Red Indians will rob you. As a person who's been in this country for two and a half years, I asked, how long have you been here? Two and a half years. 
Where would that person learn that? He did not bring it from Pakistan. Where is it coming from? That means there's an operating system that needs to be disrupted. Will you disrupt? Or will you embrace your privilege? Will you speak up? Or will you suffer the silence of the grief and the violence that racism perpetuates? Unite, connect, harmonize. This is a beautiful statement. Maybe the best I've ever read on reconciliation. A framework for reconciliation. Respect. A process of healing. Sharing truth. Saying I'm sorry. Com commemorating and revisiting the, the history. That means going back down that path in order to move forward. Sometimes we got to go back through something to get somewhere. And then we keep moving forward. Well, keep moving forward. What I'm just tired. What do I do then? I've been running down this path. If you can't run, walk. If you can't walk, crawl. If you can't crawl, reach up and say, help me. I'm staying on this path. Nothing will take me back down that other path. Recognize the legacy of colonialism. We talked about that this morning when we talked about transcendence and a post-racial society in the US. And what was brought up was, do we have a post-colonial society here? I think the answer I heard was no. Equity, what is that? We'd like to talk about equity now. So I flip it and say, let's talk about inequity. What are the inequities in the system? And are we making those inequities visible? So to me, inequity says that because I'm a black man, I don't deserve the best health that I want. Because I got to play by your rules. That means I'm not seen as a partner or a participant in my own health. I own my health. Partner with me. What does that mean then? Respect me. Make sure that I do everything I can to maintain my dignity. Show me compassion. Be empathetic with me. Listen to me. Say I'm sorry to me. Touch me. Be responsible to me. That means be able to respond to what I need, what matters to me. That's responsibility. Understand me. That's number seven. The perspective and understanding of traditional knowledge keepers are vital.
That's beyond cultural competence. It's required. The political will, will is a big word, but the political will has to exist. If not, we perpetuate the system of white supremacy and racism that continues to hurt and kill too many people. Join in leadership. Everybody in this room is a leader. Imagine how exponential that could be if we just harmonized. Being accountable, being transparent, and invest in the resources that allows everyone who wants to be healthy to be healthy. I'll admit there are some people that don't want to be healthy. That's a conversation we can have. That doesn't give me the power to control it just because that's what I think. So as a finish, whiteness is often the unspoken dominant culture that we think is normal. Middle class straight white men's opinions are seen as standard, but they're driven from self-interest and selfishness. If we begin to understand and undo this concept of whiteness, then we can begin to see the impact that it's had. So we talked about this morning the difference between intent and impact. What's important is the impact that racism has on a population that needs to be reversed. And whiteness doesn't benefit all white people. We've seen that in Alabama, in some of the rural, poor, mostly white areas. When poor whites are seen as less than because of poverty. Or it could be the rural elderly that are white. It could be people that are disabled that are white or LGBTQ plus that are white. But all those isms are driven from one place, in my opinion. When we start to truly look at the things that kill non-white people, we have to have the courage to say that the root cause is racism. But there's hope. And I'll say hope is not a plan. We have to have a plan. But there is hope. One sign of hope is I'm standing in front of you saying these things today. <laughs> the other hope is all the answers and the solutions and the commitment and the emotion and the love that I heard in the workshop this morning. That's hopeful. There are multiple signs here that are not anomalies that something is happening. And it must. So I'm proud to be a part of that kind of hope. It will not be easy, but we have to act. The non-white population here, just like in the US, continues to grow. Let's humble ourselves and learn from that growth. Let's protect that growth. Let's love that growth. Let's nurture that growth. Let's develop those five and six-year-olds to be a part of this and lead it in the future. That's the path. But we have to own that. We have to own this road. And I'm convinced after this morning that the answers, the solutions, the will to do this 
was in that room and is in this room. So I will encourage you to continue on this path, continue with love and humility, and you will be successful. So I thank you. Rather than doing questions now, I'll invite everybody to join us upstairs for lunch. Uh, you may or may not have a chance to ask your question of Dr. Wyatt, but I would encourage you to continue your conversations around the tables uh, and to think about the commitments to different actions that you can take moving forward. On behalf of the planning committee, uh, which included Carla Lavoy, Amanda Osorio, and Amanda Fowler-Woods, uh, I want to thank you again for coming. Uh, and please join me one more time in thank your doc thanking Dr. Wyatt for his contributions.